Going on to the last section of chapter 11, section 5, we're going to look at expected value and simulation. Uh, simulation is where we don't really do something, but do something that's like it, and then use that results to interpret. And expected value, as we see described here, let's take a look at it. Amy plans to spend from one to six hours on her homework. If X represents the number of hours to be spent on a given night, then the probability of various values of X, which is the amount of time, rounded to the nearest hour are shown in a table below. So let's take a look at the table. And there is the probability, uh, 5%, that she'll spend one hour, and then 10%, two hours, 20, three hours, 40%, four hours, 10%, five hours, 15%, six hours. Now, they're not telling us how they got the probability. We're just accepting that. And then what we do is we take the probability that she's going to spend one hour, which is this right here, and multiply that, get a result, and then multiply two times this, and three times this, and four, and five, and six times this, which gives us these values, and then add all of this together, and this gives us 3.85 hours is the expected value, or uh, more formally, the mathematical expectation of the quantity of time to be spent. So this is what expected value is. Now we can put that in a formula that looks like this. Here are the times. And then P stands for the probability. So the expected value is the product of the time times probability added for all six events. And that's some background on what expected value is. Okay, looking at example one. Finding the expected number of boys in a three-child family, that is, the expected value of the number of boys. Assuming girls and boys are equally likely. Well, the first thing you want to do in solving this is to define the sample space. Now, what are the possible outcomes? Well, you could have three girls, two girls and a boy, a girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, 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 boy, 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 girl, boy, 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 girl, and then three boys. These are all the possible outcomes. Now, how many items do we have in our sample space? Well, two, four, six, eight. So any one of these events is one out of eight. But then you're looking for find the expected number of boys for a three-child family. So flipping the pages would help, but looking at what we had, if there are no boys, 
how many of the triplets had no boys? Well, it was one out of eight. How many had one boy? And if you count them, there are three out of eight. Two boys. Three out of eight. And three boys. One out of eight. Now, again, the rule is you multiply the number by its probability. So we have zero times this is zero. One times this is three eighths. Two times this is six eighths. And three times this is three eighths. Now we add up our numerators and get six and six is twelve eighths, which is two thirds. Now if we convert two thirds, we get 1.5. Now, what is 1.5 out of your total possibility of 3? Well, it's half. And would you expect, in a family of three children, that on average, remember, as an expected value, that you're going to get half of them would be boys. Now, since there's three, it's not like having two and two where you could have two girls and two boys. Here, because of three, you have to split one down the middle, sort of like uh, Solomon's judgment. Okay, so that is the expected value, and that seems reasonable. Now, in example two, we're going to look at games and gambling. Again, I'm not a gambler, so I don't know too much about this but I can read it like you would. Finding expected winnings. Here a player pays three dollars to play the following game. He tosses three fair coins and we perhaps, I think we described this before, a fair coin is one that's not weighted to come out heads or tails more often and receives back payoffs of one dollar if he tosses no heads two dollars for one head three dollars for two heads and four dollars for three heads. Now find the players expected net winnings for this game. Now net winnings, what does that refer to? Well, remember, you had to pay $3 to play the game. So if you win a dollar back, you, you're losing two. In a sense, the only time you would make money is if you tossed three heads. So we're going to set this up in a chart, and it is set up below, and we'll take a look at this. Now, in a sense, what kinds of out outcomes can you get? What are the probabilities of these events? Well, interestingly, since there are three coins, just like we had the three boys, we could parallel that a little bit, but let's write them out as they did here in our sample space. Three heads, well, three tails first, and then going through the process until finally you get the three heads. So we'll keep that in mind as we look at what we have here. So 
out of all of those, and let's show it right there, how many times would you have no heads? Well, those are the three tails, and that is one out of eight. So your payoff for that is one dollar, and again, your net winnings is a, because you had to pay three dollars to play the game, is you've lost two. And if you multiply this, you get a negative two-eighths. All right, the number of times you can have one head, remember, was three-eighths. The payoff for that is two dollars. But since you paid three to play the game, you still lose a dollar. So multiplying net winnings by probability, remember we're looking for expected value, and using that formula is a negative three-eighths. Now if you end up with two heads, you get a payoff of three dollars back. Net winnings though, since you played three dollars to pay, play the game, is zero. So zero times three-eighths is zero. And then now your major payoff is if you have three heads, you get four dollars back. You finally made a dollar because you played three to play the game. And this gives you a positive results of one-eighth. So again, this is playing this game over a period of time. If you only play once and you make four dollars, then you've made one. But again, we're looking at expected value through time. Well, when you add this up, you end up with a negative four-eighths, which is a negative one-half, which is a negative fifty cents. So this game we would consider not a fair game because in the long run you're always going to lose money. So here they describe it, a game in which the expected net winnings are zero is called a fair game. Here, this is an unfair game because of the negative expected net winnings. So let's look at example C now, or three, finding the fair cost to play a game. Well, we'll use this previous example and go through it. Now, in example two, we saw that they would lose 50 cents. So if the cost to play the game was 50 cents less, so $3 minus 50 cents, that is two dollars and fifty cents, then that would be a fair game. And if you were to revalue the expected value to two fifty, we would see then it amounts to a fair game. In example four, we're taking a look at finding the fair cost to play a game. Well, they're looking at a state lottery. Players choose three digits in a specific order. 
leading digits may be zero. So the numbers are such as zero two eight and zero zero three are legitimate entries. The lottery operator randomly selects a three digit sequence and any player matching that selection receives a payoff of $600. What is the fair cost to play this game? Now here they're not telling you what a price might be so we have to just do some figuring here. The probability of selecting all three digits correctly, remember there are 10 symbols from earlier lessons, is 1 out of 10, 1 out of 10, 1 out of 10, is 1 out of 1,000. So the not winning is 999 out of a thousand. So here E, expected value of gross winnings equals $600 times one out of a thousand. Again this is the probability times amount and then probability of this times amount of zero, this is just going to be zero. So this is 0.60 when you do this multiplication, or 600 over 1,000 is 6 out of 10, 60 cents. So the fair cost of this game is 60 cents. Now, what do lotteries often charge? Well, suppose they charge a dollar. So again, they want to make money. They don't want just to break even. So by charging a dollar, they know they're going to make some money no matter what the results are. And you figure you have to buy paper, machines, people in the stores selling this. There has to be some profit. Now if they were selling the tickets for ten dollars that would be outrageous. And of course we'll let you decide on what your patterns of life will be as to whether or not you buy these things. I can say I have never bought a lottery ticket, so hmm, I'm not into that at all. But there is a joke I've heard, I'll mention it here to be put it down to posterity, that in uh, Spain, one of the regions of Spain, Catalonia, where Barcelona is located, is noted for people being rather stingy. And the joke was that this one Spaniard that lived there, Jose, every evening would pray to the Lord, God, to have him win the lottery. And every night, very strongly, he was praying. So one night this cloud appears over his house, and from the cloud a voice says, Jose, at least buy a ticket. That's the joke. Well, he was trying to win without buying a ticket. Now, if you want to play, you need to pay. <laughs> All right. In the next example, we're going to take a look at the roulette wheel invented in France. Uh, there are 36 little indentations, uh, red and black, and then there are some that are zero and double zero. So as the wheel starts in one direction, they roll a ball in the other direction 
and then finally when it stops the ball will end up in one of the slots. So that's the general direction of that and I have never played that either. So there are 38 compartments in all, 36, 18 red, 18 black, and then two are zero and double, well one zero, the other's a double zero, no color. So what the player does is places a dollar bet, these are usually chips that I think, on either red or black. So if they get the payoff, if it lands on that, they get uh, $2. Otherwise, the payoff is zero. Find the expected net winnings. Well, here your dollar, if you get 18 out of 38, remember there are two that are uncolored. And we see that over here. Otherwise, you lose a dollar. So when you do the multiplication and add these up, it adds up to a negative 1 out of 19. So again, it's not a fair game. The house wants to make money on this. So it doesn't make a lot because you're going to win uh, you know, sometimes, and uh, generally the loss is about five cents per play. Now my sister and her husband did take my wife and I to the casino just to see what it was like. And uh, the few times, actually I went there twice because the food is nice and it's a interesting atmosphere. What I did play, I don't play blackjack, I've heard of it, uh, but I do play the slot machines. Anybody can play the slot machines. Just put the money in and then pull the handle. And then every once in a while you win. And of course that's the addicting part where you win on occasion, but uh, overall you know you're not going to be a winner. But it's interesting. And uh, you find out what gambling is all about. Now they do give you something here that lets you uh, figure out the odds of things. Now our book does go into great detail looking at odds. And we're not going to ask you to remember any of these. But just know that the house is always going. That's why they're in business. But if you'd like to have a little entertainment and if you feel lucky, I don't want to... Uh, run them down, but uh, as I say, if you've earned your money honestly, that's the best way to go, probably. Now, investments. And again, you know, you hear good things and you can sometimes hear bad things, but let's look at it uh, mathematically. For example, six, finding expected investment profits. Nick has $5,000 to invest and will commit the whole amount for six months to one of three technology, technology stocks. A number of uncertainties could affect the price of these stocks, but Nick is confident, based on his research, that one of only several possible profit scenarios will prove true for each one at the end of the six month period. Okay, it's kind of like a profit here, I guess. His complete analysis is shown in table 16. For example, stock ABC could lose 400, gain 800, or gain 1500. Find the expected profit or loss for each of the three stocks. 
and select Nick's optimum choice based on these calculations. All right, well, let's take a look at these here. So after doing the multiplication that's indicated for each of these companies, we get for ABC a profit of $770, RST $600, and XYZ $730, your best bet then is to go with company ABC. And I'm sure this is what the stock analysts do uh, in Wall Street, places like that. Now, for example, seven, uh, decide which stock of example six Nick would pick in each case if he's an optimist. And again, an optimist is someone who thinks everything is nice and good and all. And then later, if he's a pessimist, that is, he's saying, oh, you know, trouble looking at stuff and thinking, well, here, optimist, the glass is half full. Pessimist, the glass is half empty. That would be the quick definition. So regarding this, where ABC could return this much, RST this much, and XYZ this much, he would pick the best case, being an optimist, the XYZ. But a pessimist, thinking that this first company could lose this much, this much would raise up to 500, but this one would get zero. He would buy this one as the worst case scenario, so to speak. In example eight, Mike, a lumber wholesaler, is considering the purchase of a railroad car loads, so this is a pretty big uh, amount, of varied dimensional lumber. He calculates that the probabilities of selling the load for 10,000, 9,000, and 8,000 are these probabilities, respectively. In order to ensure an expected profit of at least $3,000. How much can Mike pay for the load? So for this, we have to figure expected revenue or income from the resale can be found here. So here's our income times probability gives you this. Income times probability gives you this. Income times probability gives you this. So our expected revenue then is this. So if we continue reading, we see that profit is equal to revenue minus the cost. So he wants to earn at least $3,000. We know that expected revenue is this. We have to find what the cost is. So a little bit of algebra. Transpose the negative C to the other side, where it becomes a positive C. And then transpose this to the other side, a negative 3,000. We say he, in order to make this, should pay $5,770 for this railroad carload of very, 
varied dimensional lumber. Again, part of this is economics. In this next example, example 9, we're going to analyze whether or not to buy insurance. So Jeff is a wheat farmer and the crop will be ready in a certain time and he will realize a profit of $150,000 on his wheat crop unless just before it's to be harvested it rains. You might say, isn't rain good? Well, not if you're harvesting wheat. You want the wheat to be dry so when you harvest it, it doesn't spoil and f get fungus and things. So he could buy long term, uh, well, he could buy insurance for his crop against rain. But the insurance would cost $20,000. And that's just whether it's going to rain or not. Because if it rains, he will only realize $40,000. So the probability of rain is 16%. So the probability of not rain is 84 percent. So we set it up in a little table. Here's the insurance. If you pay that 20,000 you're sure to get this. And reduce crop profit minus the insurance premium that would be a net profit of 170000 So keeping that in mind, multiplying with rain, the net profit is this, times its probability, you get this. No rain, net profit would be this, times the probability would be this. So your expected profit then would be this. Now, with not insuring your crop, with rain, you get this net profit. Without rain, you get this net profit. So your expected profit is this. So now you look. Do you buy insurance or do you not buy the insurance? Well, with the insurance, you're going to have this as your expected earning. Without the insurance, you're going to have this as your expected earning. So, again, you make the decision. Probably it's a good idea to get the insurance. Now, in simulation, you've heard of uh, pilots going into a flight simulator. You're not actually in a plane, but for all practical purposes, your control is there and you are simulating. Now, when you crash, you realize you might have gotten killed if you hadn't done something right. In a simulator, you get a second chance. So, when we simulate things, we do something parallel to it but it's not the actual thing. But we are generating data. And we did this, and I mentioned earlier in my biology classes, when we would do genetic experiments, we would get some empirical number and then compare it to the theoretical or hypothetical. And uh, But let's take a look at what they're doing here. They're simulating genetic traits uh, Mendel, you recall, we are crossing red pea plants that were mixed 
and the R gene was dominant. The other gene was recessive, locase R. And when we did a hybrid cross, both parents were hybrid, call this our F1 generation, we would get this sort of results. One pure red, two heterozygous reds, and one white. And now we could duplicate that without doing it in the real flower by tossing coins. And we would duplicate it by picking out red and white little cylinders. Now here they're going to toss two coins 50 times and use the results to approximate the probability that the crossing of a heterozygous pea plant will produce three successive red flowering offspring. So there are the results. Now remember, as they say here, it's only when both tails come up do you have a white flower. So they give it out to you and you start to figure what you have. Now this is the type of study you would do when you are doing a genetics lab and you are simulating whatever technique, whether you use coins or cylinders. You had 48 combinations. So there are 20 that are red out of 48, which is about 0.417 and when you cube three-fourths is what your expected ratio you get about 0.422 and you can see that this is very close to this now again if you have few amounts of data you don't get the expected ratio but as you generate more and more, again, from earlier sections, the law of averages. And then simulating other phenomena. When we look at this, we're going to simulate births with coin tossing. And then a actual coin, 40 coins produce the results. These are two, four, five, and they're in eight groups. So five times eight is 40. And this is just what you got, whether you got a head or a tails. And for every head, we have a G for girl. And for every T, tails, a B for boy. Now they're asking us, how many pairs of two successive births are represented by the sequence? And then later, how many of those pairs consist of boys? And then find the empirical probability based on this simulation that two successive births both will be boys. Give your answer to three decimal places. So in counting this, and we're not going to go through it all, so here we have two Bs, that would be one, two Gs, that would be two, then we have three, and then four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Did I get them all? Okay, that's how you pick out the pairs, but they were looking for how many pairs altogether. Well, we had 48, uh, 40 toss, so there are actually 39 pair, because this last one didn't have anything to pair up with. But how many of those pairs consisted of boys? Well, just the boy ones, uh, counting there, was 11. And then find the empirical probability based on the simulation that two successive births will be boys. Well, it was 11 out of 39, so we get this. Now, another way to simulate things is to spin this wheel. Again, you know, if you spin it with a certain force, is it an honest wheel? You know, wheel of fortune, I don't know how they do that and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, let's go on to example 12, simulating births with random numbers. So here they're using the spinning of the wheel up there to, uh, do you end up with a digit? And they're saying, let the odd digits be a boy, the even digits be a girl. Now what they've done is they've actually picked out the ones with three uh, boys. Or more. And they found that that was more than three boys, they had 10 arrows out of the 50 sequences gave you a 20%. And that's your estimated empirical probability. The theoretical value, if you recall from an earlier lesson, and we didn't do 11.4, but is this. So you see point, almost point 0.19 and point 0.20 are very close. In our last example, uh, simulating car drawings with random numbers, use random number simulation to estimate the probability that two cards drawn from a standard deck with replacement both will be the same suit. So for the numbers, uh, 0 and 1 mean that you have a club. 2 and 3 means you have a diamond. 4 and 5 means hearts. 6 and 7 mean spades. Now any combinations of 8 and 9 are disregarded because that doesn't fit into our system. Now we take a look at our table and there's what we got and then they converted it to this. Again, I wouldn't expect you to be doing things like this. But when you do count, you verify that you have 39 successive pairs of suits of the four kinds nine of them are pairs of the same suits so nine out of 39 give you this now the theoretical value is 25 percent so our simulated value again came rather close okay well this will wrap up 
our lesson. They do give you lots of things and there are some exercises.